Good afternoon, folks. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Good. Uh, are you ready for a nice, uh, easy week this week? Yeah, very thankful for that. Yeah, no tests this week. I think this is our only week, except for week one, where there wasn't a... Uh, I already had $830. I hadn't been thinking about it. Honestly, the time I counted calories and actually lost weight, I was done eating by three, four every day. But that's because I still wanted to eat what the fuck I wanted to eat. I mean, you know what I mean? And if that. <laughs> Desiree, we could hear you there. So I went ahead and muted you. Um, okay. It is now one o'clock. So I'll be adding people as they come in. But um, let's go ahead and get started on 22A and B, and we'll jump over to 22C. And then uh, what we can do is, because we have a little bit more time, because we're not doing a test review, we can go over last week's test for anybody who wants to do that. OK. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Progress. Okay, remember, unless you are uh, wanting to chime in and say something, go ahead and mute yourself uh, so that whatever's happening in the background doesn't, uh, doesn't end up coming through. Okay, so we're talking about breathing, respiration now. One of those got turned over, flipped over. Uh, okay, here we go. Respiratory system, the lungs are the exchange surface for both oxygen and CO2. The area is about 75 square meters. That's about half of the size of a normal house. So if you opened up all your lungs and spread out all the curved surfaces, it would take up about half the floor space in most people's houses. Very thin walls, if you remember Fick's Law, we talked about uh, D being small. So if you want fast diffusion of oxygen and CO2, you gotta make it very thin. Um, okay, so off we go. Uh, moist surface, uh, all, all diffusion, all biological diffusion happens across a moist surface. So digestive and respiratory are smooth. Excuse me, moist. Uh, the ribs and skin protect the lungs from damage. Diaphragm and ribs pump the air. So here's one of the things you might find interesting is that the lungs are completely passive in terms of the breathing process. It's the muscles of the diaphragm and intercostal muscles and some of the uh, pectoralis muscles that actually do the pumping of the air. The, the lungs don't move the air at all. Uh, in, in inhalation, the intercostals contract, the ribs move upwards, and diaphragm contracts as it moves downwards. The diaphragm is shaped like this when it's relaxed and flattens, and that makes a greater uh, uh, volume above it. So one of the things you guys should catch is that greater volumes give lower pressure, less volume gives greater pressure. Imagine taking a large amount of air and compressing it together, that gives you higher pressure. So as you expand the space, the pressure drops. And as you compress the space, you're putting more air in a smaller space that's pressing against the walls harder. So in exhalation, the intercostal uh, muscles relax, ribs fall, and diaphragm relaxes. So exhalation is primarily a passive process unless it's active or forced expiration. Okay, this is a quick overview of how the respiratory and cardiovascular system move oxygen from the atmosphere to your cells, and then CO2 from the cells to the blood, and then out to the lungs and out to the environment. Okay, the respiratory system exchanges oxygen from air to the blood in the lungs, and then from the blood to the cells and body tissues. It exchanges CO2 in the opposite way, that is from the cells to the blood on the venous side, and from the blood out to the air as we exhale. It helps regulate blood pH. Now, how does that work? Well, it turns out that carbon dioxide mixes with water, which is about half of what your blood is. It generates a chemical called carbonic acid. So by removing more CO2, 
you're also removing more acid from the blood. And part of what causes discomfort when we hold our breath <laughs> is not the accumulation of carbon dioxide, it's the accumulation of acid in our blood. Please remember to mute yourself unless you are wanting to say something, especially if there's anything in the background. All right, vocalization, speech is something that we're able to do as a result of our respiratory system and protection of the body from inhaled pathogens. We're gonna see later that there are wandering macrophages, which are white blood cells that engulf any pathogenic microorganisms that would come in with the dust, the air that you breathe in. Okay, airways, conduction of air from outside to alveoli. Um, part of what your airways do is they filter warm and moist air. Filter in that it's not going through a filter, but the fact that the dust sticks to the mucus on the walls of the respiratory tract does actually filter it. So by the time it gets to your alveoli, most of the dust particles have already stuck to the mucus of your airways. It warms it because there's warm blood surrounding it and moistens it due to evaporation. The pathway is either the nose and the mouth, then the trachea, then the primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, and then bronchioles, eventually down to the alveoli, which is uh, Italian for grape cluster. And you can see why they call it that. Now, one of the things that this figure is trying to show you is a huge increase in cross-sectional area as well as um, the number. So as you can see, we have one trachea, we have two primary bronchi, and then we go from four to, uh, what is that, 40,000 when we get to the smaller bronchi. But when you see the bronchioles goes eight times 10 to the seventh, and then alveoli 10 to the eighth. That's a huge number of very, very small objects. And the cross-sectional area goes up really significantly. Look, that's one times 10 to the sixth centimeter squared. That's a million, a million square centimeters that makes up our airways. So the cross-sectional area expands significantly, exponentially as we move deeper into the lungs. Okay, talking about some gas laws. This is a figure directly from your book. Gas is compressible and can be pressurized. This is important for scuba divers. That's how they're able to breathe underwater for so long. If you take atmospheric air, you compress it, and you can breathe out off of it for minutes or hours. Um, by the way, uh, liquids cannot be compressed, and that's one of the big differences. Airflow decreases with increased resistance. So I ask, what other material behaves like this? And the other material that we talked about was blood or fluid. If you want to restrict the movement of fluid, you restrict the diameter of the tube, and that increases resistance. And so uh, air, believe it or not, to physicists, it's just a very low viscosity, low density fluid. It behaves in a very similar way. So if you wanna restrict airflow through a tube, you either make it longer, which is less effective, or you narrow its diameter, and that's gonna be a much more effective way of reducing the flow through it. So you notice here, when we're talking about pressure, PV uh, on one equals PV two. So pressure times volume one equals pressure times volume two. So if you increase the volume, you have to decrease the pressure in order to make these equal. So as you see, we had a large volume here. We decreased the volume that increased the pressure. Why is that the case? Because these particles that move with a certain amount of momentum strike a much smaller amount of surface, hitting more surface uh, per particle than it would be the case here. There's fewer particles hitting the wall. So that's why the pressure increases. Air is a mix of gases. Each diffuses independently in and out occurs at the same time. Air is mostly nitrogen. Uh, with small amounts of carbon dioxide, oxygen. Um, Boyle's law, I don't, I don't know if we're going to, uh, this is Boyle's law here. Uh, pressure increases, I don't think this is the right, oh, it is, this is the right figure. Number. Okay, so in, in the gas pressure increases, the volume decreases. All right, so this is from your book. All right, the pumps. As I mentioned earlier, inspiration is the movement of air into the lungs, and this happens as a result of low pressure. Might seem counterintuitive, but uh, air always wants to move from high to low pressure. So if you generate low pressure in your lungs by expanding the space, air is going to rush in to fill that lower pressure. That's why you breathe in. You breathe out by compressing the air that pushes the air out as expiration. So the movement of air is out of the lungs. That's due to high pressure as a result of dropping your ribs and allowing your uh, diaphragm to rise up, decreasing the volume and increasing the pressure. Remember, volume and pressure inversely proportional. Diaphragm is a flat sheet of skeletal muscle tissue. Now, how do you know it's skeletal and not smooth? Does anybody want to take a shot at that? How do we know that the diaphragm is skeletal muscle and not smooth muscle? Anybody want to take a quick guess? Because you can control it. 
Yes, because you have the ability to control it. Now, you don't always have to think about breathing, but because you can hold your breath for as long as you, you know, are able, that makes it skeletal muscle. It's shaped like an inverted U when relaxed. There is a test question about that, so it will show an upside down U as the shape. That's when it's relaxed, and it flattens out more into a flat uh, structure, uh, increases the volume of the chest cavity, and that's for inhalation. The thorax is what we call our chest. The ribs and the muscles contract during inhalation. The pleura is a membrane, a double membrane sac surrounding the lungs. So one of the membranes lines the inside of your thoracic cavity. The other covers the lungs directly in between them is the pleural fluid that allows the ribs to stick to the lungs. And that's exactly what you want. The reason why the lungs inflate is because they are stuck to the inside of the ribs. And as the ribs expand, the lungs expand with it. And it works very much like a suction cup. Now, you guys have all used suction cups before, right? So what you do with a suction cup is you press it against glass. But what you're doing is when you press against the suction cup, you're pushing the air out from underneath it. Then when the suction cup rises up, now there's a little space in there that has very low pressure. And the reason why the suction cup stays up against the glass is because the pressure on the inside of the suction cup is far less than on the outside. So what's actually holding your suction cup up against the glass is the higher pressure on the outside than on the inside. So what happens if you equalize the pressure between the inside of the suction cup and the outside? What's going to happen to the suction cup if the pressure is the same on both sides? It's going to fall off. It's going to fall off. So your lungs stick to your inside of your ribs in the same way the suction cup sticks to a gla glass. And that is the air on the inside of your lungs is actually pushing outward and holding your lungs up against the ribs. Now, what do you think would happen if you let air into the gap between your ribs and your lungs? Into that space that's supposed to be air free. Deflate? Right, it's called a collapsed lung. And the reason why people get collapsed lungs is because air is allowed to uh, go into that pleural space. And because the lungs wanna shrink in the same way that a balloon wants to shrink, um, the only way to get a lung to inflate again is to remove that move that out. And I'll be talking about it here. The fluid lubrication is the pleural fluid. It, means it maintains adherence to the inner surface of the ribs for inhalation. So it's got to be sticky and it's got to be gas-free, air-free. It's a vacuum seal. A perforation can cause collapse. It's called collapsed lung or pneumothorax. You guys have probably heard the term pneumothorax. Pneumo means air. Thorax means chest. It means you have air in your chest. Now, you always have air inside your lungs, but you're not supposed to have it between your lungs and your ribs. And that would normally only happen during some kind of an accident or a stabbing or shooting, something where air is able to get into that gap between your ribs and your lungs. So this is how it works. This figure is not in your book, but they exaggerate the amount to which your lungs would collapse. It would only collapse somewhere between 10 and 20%, but they're showing it almost like a balloon collapsing. And if you want to get the lungs to reinflate, you have to remove the air from it and seal the gap that caused the air to come through. All right, factors affecting ventilation. Air resistance is the main thing that affects airflow into and out of the lungs. So airway resistance is primarily due to the uh, cross-sectional diameter or radius of the tube. Airway resistance is dependent on the diameter or radius of the tubes. Mucus blockage can reduce the diameter. One of the things that we do to reduce the mucus that, excuse me, the mucus blockage is coughing. And that's how we get mucus out of our lungs is by coughing. When there's bronchoconstriction in the same way the venoconstriction or vasoconstriction decreases the diameter of a blood vessel, this is gonna decrease the diameter of the bronchioles. Please note the only, uh, the only tubes that are allowed to expand and contract are the bronchioles. The trachea and primary and secondary bronchi cannot expand and contract because of the presence of uh, cartilage around. And this is smooth muscle, so it's completely uh, involuntary and subconscious. Now, allergic reactions can cause histamines to be released by mast cells. This is part of anaphylaxis, and um, this can affect breathing. In bronchodilation, the diameter of the airways increase, and that allows more air into the air. Muscles relax usually due to high CO2 levels in the blood. So if you need more, um, let's see, let's go to a chat. A great scene involving that concept is the movie Three Kings, a bit more accurate treatment of neurothorax in the adrenal needle. Yeah, we were talking about adrenaline needles in Pulp Fiction. 
very few movies get science right, uh, but I don't remember that particular scene, but I trust you. Okay, so normally high CO2 levels are gonna cause airways to expand. Low CO2 levels uh, are gonna cause them to decrease in, in uh, diameter. Okay, moving on to part B. I don't know if you guys have a separate document for B, but now we are in part B. Okay, this is a very old school device. It's called a Bell spirometer, and they don't use them very much because uh, you know computers are far better than old school things. Well, not always. Now, one of the reasons why I really like these Bell spirometers is even though it traces it on paper, the reason why it's better than what hooking up to a computer is the following. Now, computers can check your inhalation and exhalation, but what they normally can't do is they can't check how much oxygen you're consuming. So what happens here in these old fashioned Bell spirometers is as you breathe in and out, normally you would expect the oxygen to be replaced by CO2 and the volume would remain the same as you breathe in and out. But at the base of these Bell spirometers is a material called sodalone. And what it does when heated, it, after it's been heated significantly is it can absorb carbon dioxide. So as you're breathing, the carbon dioxide is being absorbed here by the soda line. And so what happens is the volume starts to decrease and you can use the declination or the angle of these up and down to determine how much oxygen you're consuming. And that's something you can do with the old fashioned bell spirometers, not so much with the modern uh, spirometers attached to computers. All right, older spirometers use a bell, water and CO2 absorbent to measure breathing. Modern ones use a computer. Spirometers can be used to check for obstructive lung diseases like emphysema and chronic bronchitis. You can see if airway is being, the airway is being restricted by looking at how, these, uh, how much air is coming in and out and how long it takes, uh, maximum inhalation and exhalation, things like that. Okay, lung volumes. What is tidal volume? Well, it's called tidal volume because it reminded scientists of the tides coming in and out, normal in and out. So that's our normal inhalation exhalation. So from total inhalation to total exhalation and normal breathing. Now, inspiratory reserve is what you can do beyond inhalation. So if I breathe in, I can breathe a lot more in if I'm going to cough or if I'm gonna blow up a balloon or blow out candles, something like that. That's the, the amount you can inhale beyond a normal tidal volume. Expiratory reserve is the opposite. So when you breathe out normally, you can still now, uh, you can't exhale all the air from your lungs, but you can exhale most of it. The reason why you can't exhale all of it is because there's airways and empty spaces that you can't wring out like you would a sponge. The residual volume is the amount of air remaining in the lungs after maximal exhalation cannot be measured directly. It has to be estimated. So it's the only volume in all the ones that we're going to be talking about today that's estimated rather than measured. Vital capacity is total inhalation max to exhalation max. That means the, the amount of air that you can move, vital means alive, that you can move while living of max in to max out. Um, this is in your book and it shows you tidal volume in ye yellow, expiratory reserve in green, inspiratory reserve in orange, or peach, whatever that is, and residual volume purple. Remember, this is not measurable. So notice that this is functional residual capacity, everything below here, and this is inspiratory capacity. Vital capacity is everything between the green and the top of the pink, and total lung capacity is all. So this is a great figure. It could potentially be on the test. I don't think it is. Uh, remember, there is no test today. Um, oh, by the way, Matt, uh, I just sent you an email. Uh, the, the dates were correct for the tests when I looked both in the syllabus and in the start here. So I'm not sure where you, where you got those other dates from, but uh, when I checked, they were correct. So end of next week, exam five, and then end of the following week, uh, which is the 28th, is the final. Now, please remember, folks, I'm going to be repeating this over and over so everybody gets this. The final exam is due on a Thursday night, not a Sunday night. So if you blow off what I'm saying and don't note this, you will get a zero on the final. It will count and it will hurt your grade. You'll say, I didn't know. And it says both in the syllabus and in the Start Here page. And I'm telling you, and I'm going to send several emails. So if you ignore all of that, and don't get your test done by Thursday night. You will receive a zero 
and no um, no uh, sympathy from me because I'm, I'm explaining that to you. All right, so this is also showing you um, the different measures that you can do and the function of it. Uh, this, these definitions are probably not gonna be on the test, but uh, this was from your text and it might be very interesting for you to check out. Okay, this figure is likely to be on an exam coming up. I, I'm not 100% sure if it is or isn't, but I'm gonna assume that it is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through what these different components of this graph are. And I'll explain to you so that you could do an essay if it does come up on uh, exam five next week. During periods of high demand or low ventilation, blood leaving alveoli has not shown adequate gas exchange. So everything to the left is inadequate gas exchange. You can see the PO2 drops and this PCO2 rises. Um, hey folks, really quick, I'm just gonna double check something. Um, so that we don't have to guess. Uh, give me just a moment. And what I'm gonna do here is look at module seven. Lecture exam five is multiple choice only and the final is multiple choice only. Okay, so let's go back to this. So uh, no, no more essays. You guys are done with essays for the semester. How does that sound? It sounds delicious. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, so the, what it was is that for exam five, there was a separate exam that had the essays on it. And I thought you guys have worked enough on explaining yourself verbally. Uh, so there's no more essays. Now the downside of that, that means now there's no more extra credit because the only way to get extra credit is doing essays. So the extra credit that was available on the previous exams is all that you're gonna get for the rest of the semester. Please don't request an extra credit uh, activity or assign because there aren't any. All right, so this figure will not be on the test, but it does show you what's going on uh, during periods of high demand or low ventilation, blood leaving alveoli has not shown adequate gas exchange, left side of the graph. During periods of hyperventilation, O2 levels go above normal, CO2 levels go below normal. So hyperventilations, O2 levels go above normal, CO2 levels go down. And what they normally do for people who are hyperventilating, they give them, have them blow in a bag. And the reason is because if CO2 levels drop too low, it can change the pH of the blood and potentially make you pass out. And if you clunk your head, that could ruin your whole day. Okay. Uh, this figure is uh, not an essay because there's no more essays. So this was normally an essay on my exams, but I decided to delete the essay portion from exam five. So you're off the hook for this. All right, gas exchange in the alveoli. They're very thin cells, allow rapid diffusion of oxygen in and CO2 out. Surfactant cells in the alveoli. So what is surfactant? Well, if you guys have ever studied any fluid physics um, or study how water works, there's bonds between water molecules called hydrogen bonds. It makes them really want to stick together. And inside the alveoli, the water on the surface makes the alveoli want to shrink. And if they touch, water wants to stick to itself. If you guys ever tried to separate two pieces of wet glass, it's nearly impossible because the water is very sticky to itself. So what surfactant does is reduces the likelihood that two surfaces are going to stick together because you don't want the surfaces to stick together on the inside of your lungs, you want them to stick between the lungs and the ribs. So it produces surfactant, which reduces surface tension. That reduces the likelihood the surface is going to stick together if they touch. The reduced surface tension pre prevents alveolar surfaces from sticking together. So this is the opposite of the pleural fluid, where you do want adhesion of the uh, ribs to the lung surface. So elastic fibers, one of the reasons why you exhale passively is because your lungs are built kind of like a latex balloon. And that is there are elastic fibers that when you relax, it pushes actively by elastic recoil, pushes the out of your lungs. And this can also um, be an issue if you don't have surfactant. And by the way, the, one of the reasons why they put uh, preemies on nebulization therapy uh, when they're first born is because you don't start producing uh, surfactant inside your lungs until a certain period, I want to say around seven and a half to eight months. And if premiums are born before that, they don't produce the surfactant. So the nebulization therapy is like this mist that goes in their lungs that gives them the surfactant that they need. 
Last but not least, capillaries cover 90% of the alveolar surface because the capillaries is the spot where the red blood cells are, and that's what's going to be picking up the oxygen. Okay, this shows you the anatomy here, a cross section of this. You can see the surfactant cells look kind of furry. You can see white blood cells here that are patrolling for invading microorganisms, and blood vessels are these red surfaces here. Now, notice that the, the walls of the uh, capillaries and alveoli are very, very thin. Red blood cells are exceptionally small themselves, and you can see there's an extremely tiny 0.1 to 1.5 micrometers. That's a thousand times smaller than a, uh, wait a minute, 100 times? 100 times smaller than a millimeter? Anyway, it's extremely thin. And the idea is that you want to reduce D to reduce, uh, to increase diffusion for air into the, or oxygen into the blood. All right, matching ventilation with alveolar blood flow. Perfusion is the flow of blood around an alveolus. So that's how much blood is moving through the alveoli. When alveoli are not well ventilated, normally blood flow around that area is reduced. Now, how does that work? Normally the capillaries shrink so that the blood will not go around an alveolus that doesn't have fresh air in it. You want the blood to move around alveoli that do have fresh air. So that matching how much fresh air there is into the alveoli with how much blood flows around it is called ventilation perfusion matching. So look, um, by the way, here's, here's some things that you should know. These brackets here are, are to indicate what is called partial pressure. That means the amount of pressure due just to the oxygen uh, molecules in the air. So low partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli causes an increase in vasoconstriction of the arterial, and that reduces blood flow so that you don't send blood around an inadequately uh, ventilated alveolus. High partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli increases vasodilation of the arterial, and that increases blood flow. So you have more blood going around the ventilated alveolus, picking up more oxygen. When the amount of blood moving around the alveolus does not match the ventilation, it's called ventilation perfusion mismatch. So that's a problem. So matching is normally what happens in a healthy individual, but if it doesn't work properly, it's called ventilation perfusion mismatch. Ventilation perfusion matching is normally under local control within the lungs, so it's not a reflex that needs to go out to the spinal cord or brain. Okay, so this shows you how it works normally. And here this is uh, the normal mechanism when you have low, notice that this kind of bluer color means that there's more CO2. So notice that they're sending, the body's sending less blood around this alveolus because there's less fresh air. More blood is going around the alveolus that has fresh air, so you get nice gas exchange. But in this situation, you have mismatch. You're sending blood around an inadequately ventilated alveolus. And so now the blood leaving is purple, which indicates low oxygen content, and that's the problem. I may be asking questions about this. What is happening at A? What is happening at B? And what is happening at C? And that is this. Okay, so these figures may be on there as multiple choice questions asking what is going on in each of these figures. So study that. Okay, lining of the respiratory tract. This is a diagram of it. This is an actual uh, light micrograph or slide of the respiratory tract. Goblet cells produce the mucus that rides on the top of a layer of watery saline. What is the mucus for? It sticks dust particles so that they don't end up all the way into your alveoli, causing problems and blocking your ability to diffuse. So when the dust sticks to the mucus, it moves the mucus upwards towards your throat, and you cough it out or it ends up in your nose, and you blow your nose, and all that mucus that comes out, the main job of it was to trap dust particles. Goblet cells produce mucus to trap inhaled particles, and the cilia of the epithelial cells here move the mucus on a layer of saline, now, the reason why it has to be a layer of saline is because the mucus is thick, it can't be moved. So you move the saline and the mucus on top of it moves on top of the saline. Okay, so this is a summary going over the stuff that we talked about. All right, so we are now gonna switch to uh, part C. So if you do have that as a separate document, pull that out. Okay, I'm going to share this. Okay, this is the last part of chapter 22, gas exchange and transport. 
This is what we saw before, but now we're going into a little bit more detail of what's happening at each of the stages. This figure will not be on your test, but it does show you the effect of the respiratory system in conjunction with the cardiopulmonary system. Okay, now this figure is not in your book, but it does show you the difference between how oxygen and CO2 dissolves in water and why we need red blood cells. Now notice oxygen dissolving here, but notice how few oxygen diatomic oxygen gas molecules are at equilibrium. That means when the oxygen has been able to go as long as it needs to go in. But look at the difference in CO2. So CO2 dissolves much more in water than does oxygen. So the reason, this is the reason why we need red blood cells, because water does not carry oxygen very well. So you have to carry oxygen in red blood cells. Now the CO2 is carried by our plasma, the water in our blood, but not oxygen. Um, There's a is, pressure. It, is it fair to say that the CO2 is expelled through the body by sweating as one of the ways? Not much. I mean, some, a very small amount. What sweating does is it helps you get rid of a material called urea, partly what we get rid of in our kidneys. But uh, you don't get rid of a lot of CO2 through sweating. So, so where does it go when it binds to the water and plasma? It goes to your lungs. Oh, I go. Oh, and so, oh, and then it detaches from the so, water, and then so, it yeah. Goes so it, it diffuses out of the water at your lungs. In uh, as so, the CO two is leaving the water of your plasma, going into the, the your lungs, and out at the same time. Oxygen is coming in to grab hold of the hemoglobin in your blood cells. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. The plasma carries CO two. The red blood cells carry oxygen. Okay, so temperature, here's something that you should know. There's an inverse relationship. Now, there's a question on the test that says, most substances dissolve better in warm water. And that's a true statement, most do. So for example, if you guys have ever tried to dissolve sugar in coffee or hot tea, it dissolves really fast, right? But if you ever put sugar in iced tea, it dissolves really slowly. What's the difference? Temperature, right? So normally, if you increase the temperature, things will dissolve more, right? If you want to dissolve a lot of sugar in a recipe, you heat up the water, right? You guys ever done that, right? Heat water to get more sugar to dissolve. But gases are the opposite. Gases are not most substances. So be careful on the test. Test five is going to say most substances dissolve better in warm water. And most substances and gases are different things. You guys get that? It's true, most substances want warmer water to diffuse or to dissolve. Gases prefer the opposite. Now, why is that the case? Well, if you look at this figure here of the oxygen particles, some of them are escaping the surface of the water. Now, it turns out the amount that escape the water is primarily due to the amount of momentum they have. The momentum that they have is directly proportional to their temperature. So for example, if you warm up water, it's gonna give these gas particles more momentum to escape the surface and leave. Now, you could test this at home. You could try this. If you guys ever been boiling water, and you put water into the pot and there's no bubbles, right? But then when you start to heat it, about halfway between cold water and boiling, you see bubbles starting to form around the edge. That's not boiling water. What's happening is the gas is in the water are starting to escape because you're warming it. And you see bubbles forming around the edge. And then eventually, boiling occurs, but by then you've driven out most of the gases. So if you want to try that at home, you can get it. As you warm the water, it makes it harder for the gases to stay in there. And that's why cold water carries more oxygen than warm water. So you find most of the active fish, believe it or not, in cold water versus warm water, because there's more oxygen in cold water than in warm water. Does that make sense, guys? I hope it does. Anyway, there you go. Solubility, the degree to which a material dissolves in water. So solubility for most substances goes up with temperature. For gases, it goes down. So for both oxygen and CO2, the amount that can be held in the liquid decreases with increased temperature. But please remember that gases are not the same thing as most substances. So if you get that wrong in the test, it's your problem because I explained that thoroughly now. People do that. They'll get it wrong and they'll say, Mr. Sage, you said, and I'll say, no, 
I said, gases are not the same thing as most solid food. All right. So this is the partial pressure of various gases in the air that we notice that there's 159 millimeters mercury of oxygen, nitrogen. And by the way, do you guys know what that millimeters of mercury is about? It has to do with how much mercury actually rose up into a tube back in the day when they used to use liquid mercury as a way to determine air pressures. So if you put oxygen, 159, and nitrogen together, you have a 760 approximately. Uh, this is the air pressure uh, at sea level, 760 millimeters of mercury. All right, O2 exchange at the tissues and then the lungs. Gas is always diffused from an area of high concentration to lower concentration. This is just normal diffusion. In the capillaries of body tissues, there's always more oxygen in the blood than in the cells, so it diffuses into the cells. And remember, it's going to diffuse into the extracellular fluid or come with the extracellular fluid. If you guys remember, I talked about bulk flow, how some of the liquid from your blood actually leaves your capillary. And what it brings with it is that oxygen. So what happens is the, extracell the plasma turns into extracellular fluid. Now the extracellular fluid is right up against the cells. That's where the gas exchange occurs. And then some of it gets drawn back uh, into the blood and some of it ends up in your, uh, in your lymphatic fluid. All right, in the air of the lungs, the concentration of O2 is always higher than blood, so O2 moves inward. So this is a way that you constantly make sure that uh, air oxygen is going from the air to the blood and from the blood to the cells, because there's always a concentration gradient. If too little O2 is absorbed in the lungs, this results in what is called hypoxia. Hypo means less, oxia means air, less oxygen or inadequate oxygen. So what could cause it? High altitude. Now, why does high altitude cause it? Because the pressure of the air itself is much lower, so that means there's less of a driving force to get oxygen in there. Now, um, have you guys ever heard about Mount, uh, the highest mountain in the world is Mount Everest, right? Well, it turns out if you look from a somewhat of a distance, it looks like there's little dots of color on the way up to Mount Everest. It turns out that those are actually um, jackets of people who've passed away on their way up to Mount Everest. And so why do people die? It's because they get exhausted or they, they don't have enough oxygen. The air is very, very thin up there, very little oxygen. And the amount of oxygen that we need to climb a mountain is greater than is available on Everest for most people. And so they have to take oxygen with them. And there's a lot of dead bodies on the slopes of Mount Everest because nobody really wants to go up there and fetch them and, and bury them. All right, so high altitude, this could also happen if you had depressurization on an airplane. You guys ever seen the thing where the air masks drop down in the case of a depressurization? That's so that you can uh, breathe oxygen and you're supposed to put yourself yours on first before you put your kids on, because if you pass out, neither one of you gets oxygen. You could pot potentially end up hypoxic. All right, decreased breathing if you're not breathing enough. For example, if somebody stops breathing. Anemia, the inability of the body to carry oxygen. Carbon, CO is carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide poisoning causes hypoxia because it turns out the carbon monoxide molecule actually has a higher affinity for hemoglobin than oxygen does. And that's part of the reason why people get headaches in traffic is because the carbon monoxide that's coming out of the tailpipe, the car in front of you, is binding to your hemoglobin and displacing the oxygen so you're actually slightly hypoxic when you're in traffic. Um, that won't be the case in 50 years because there won't be a lot of carbon monoxide coming out of cars because they'll be electric. All right, cardiovascular failure and cyanide can also cause hypoxia because it also blocks uh, respiratory pathways. All right, it usually goes with hypercapnia, which is increased levels of CO2. I showed you in that figure that as CO oxygen levels drop, CO2 levels rise, uh, but you could have CO2 levels remaining nice and steady with oxygen levels dropping, and that would be at high altitude, where you're able to vent off the CO2, but you're not bringing back in oxygen. So in the situation where hypoxia would occur, but not hypercapnia, now they go together when you're holding your breath, but when you're at altitude, you're getting rid of the CO2, but not breathing in oxygen. Adequate. Okay, so this shows you what is happening with oxygen. So in the, in the, uh, respiratory, uh, excuse me, the pulmonary arteries. Remember the in the pulmonary side, it's gonna be reverse pulmonary arteries and arterioles and capillaries. It's gonna come in deoxygenated 40. 
uh, partial pressure and then leave it 100, it drops off from 100 to 40. So you lose about 60% going from arterial to venous side. So there's going to be a drop off of about 60%. Um, in the capillaries of body tissues, there's always less CO2 in the blood than the cells. So this is going to be the opposite. So it always diffuses from the cells into the extracellular fluid, then from the extracellular fluid into the blood. In the air of the lungs, the concentration of CO2 is always lower than in the blood. So CO2 moves outward. This is normally the case as long as you're not in a high CO2 environment. Buffer role, buffers in the blood prevent changes in the blood pH. Do you guys remember I told you when you hold your breath, and CO2 accumulates, that generates carbonic acid. One of the reasons why your blood doesn't become acidic immediately is because buffers absorb those uh, hydrogen ions, or protons, up to a point. And then when that becomes saturated, then the pH starts to drop, acidity rises, and you usually start to panic, meaning that you need to breathe. As CO2 levels in the blood rise, it combines with water to form carbonic acid. And this is what we're sensing, by the way. Here's something you might find interesting. We don't have oxygen sensors in our conscious mind. So what we're sensing is actually the pH of our blood. So when you start feeling panicked because you're not breathing, isn't because you're running out of oxygen, it's because you're accumulating CO2 beyond the buffer ability of the blood to absorb the protons that are generated when CO2 combines with water. Buffers absorb excess hydrogen ion, hydrogen plus ions, which is the same thing as a proton, until CO2 can be released at the lungs, which stabilizes the pH. You hold your breath too long, CO2 levels accumulate, pH drops, and you start to panic. So let's take a look at CO2 diffusion. Notice it's much less than for oxygen. So you go from 46 in the, uh, on the deoxygenated side, which is the, the pulmonary artery side, to the pulmonary vein side. We're only dropping from 46 to 40. That's much, much different than what's happening in the oxygen. Remember, the oxygen the change was 60%. Six out of 46 is maybe 12 to 14%. So the amount of, uh, the, of change between, I got a fly around me, I'm not crazy, um, is much, much less than the amount that you pick up. So you're getting rid of less CO2 than you're picking up in terms of oxygen. So that's one of the key things there. Uh, all physiological diffusion happens on a wet surface. So as we said that before, there's a very thin epithelium, which increases the rate of diffusion, a repeat from before. What are some diseases that can affect alveolar exchange? So emphysema, what is emphysema? It's a degenerative loss of alveolar surface area. So if you remember, one of the things about thick sloth was having a large surface area. If you reduce surface area, you're gonna reduce diffusion. That can lead to hypoxia. So a lot of people who have emphysema are on, have oxygen supplements because they don't have enough alveolar surface area to get the oxygen in normally. Are, are you talking like, about like nutritional supplements? No, or, no, no. I'm talking about, you know, like the, the, where they have the little tube under their nose and the oh, little things okay. going in. Um, okay. That's what people need who have emphysema because you and I have enough surface area to get the oxygen we need out of the air. But because they have less surface area, they have to be injecting pure oxygen in with their inhaled air so that the uh, amount of oxygen entering their blood remains somewhat similar. And this can often be a result of smoking or living in the high desert. It turns out living in the high desert is, is not very great for your lungs. I've been here for 20 years now. Uh, so what happens is uh, the chemicals in the smoke cause uh, the macrophages to release enzymes. And that enzyme then destroys the alveolar surface area, uh, causing emphysema. So a lot of ex-smokers have emphysema due to this process. Fibrotic lung disease is, is caused by the scar tissue buildup. This decreases diffusion because it increases the D. So instead of reducing the surface area, now this gets thicker. And the thicker the distance between the red blood cell and the alveolar lumen or air, the less diffusion there's gonna be. So fibrotic lung disease um, decreases diffusion. This fly is driving me crazy. Does COVID uh, cause fibrotic lung disease? Oh, gosh, I can't remember exactly what COVID does. I think so. I, think I know it, it causes like that, the scar tissue because the cytokines keep going back and forth, but right. try to, and then they permeate the plasma membrane and then fluid starts leaking and that causes the SARS, the sudden acute respiratory, the pneumonia. So and it it's can, not it pneumonia. Both of oh, both of those? Oh. Okay. Wait, um, I'm sorry. No. I, here, 
put my edema, wait a minute. Um, it doesn't, one of the things that's not listed here is pneumonia. So yes, it is all, it is generating scar tissue and it's generating fluid on the surface, but it's not listed here. One of the things that you wanna note is that pulmonary edema is a buildup of fluid between the layers, not inside the lungs. So pulmonary edema is between the, uh, between the surface of the alveoli and the blood vessel, whereas pneumonia builds up fluid on the inside of the alveoli. But it's functionally similar because now you're increasing D. And remember that oxygen does not like to diffuse through water. So if you put a layer of water between the air and the red blood cells, you're increasing D and decreasing diffusion. So that's part of the reason why people have respiratory problems with, um, with COVID is not only are you generating scar tissue, it depends on whether it's acute or uh, chronic is long COVID or short COVID and, and also how severe the case of the COVID is. Um, people who have had uh, vaccines and boosters tend to get less severe COVID and therefore less lung damage when they get it. I've had one or two boosters now. I've had my main shot and a booster and I think I'm getting my second booster uh, in October when the new uh, round comes around. But asthma is different. Asthma is, is not, has nothing to do with surface area or thickness. It has to do with decreasing ventilation. That means the tubes shrink in size. And what they normally do for that is either a prescription medication, which is taken regularly, or a rescue inhaler, which you would take. Um, and what that you normally in the past contained were uh, steroid hormones that cause the smooth muscle that are constricting to release or to uh, relax and open up the airway. That's what normally what rescue inhalers have. Okay, so here's some, this is a normal lung. This is emphysema. Notice that it's less curvy, it's more smooth. That decreases the uh, area. Fibrotic lung disease thickens the walls here, increasing D. Pulmonary edema, remember there's a fluid here between the alveoli and the blood vessel. And then asthma, the only one that wasn't shown there would have been uh, pneumonia, which is this fluid instead of being here would be on the inside of the alveoli. And then asthma is decreased uh, ventilation. This also used to be an essay where I asked you to talk about what they were, what caused them and what the treatments were, but you guys got off the hook this so much. This would have been what you would have had to tell me about if we had had essays on exam five, which we don't this semester. Okay, gas transport in the blood, oxygen, we're getting pretty close to the end. In the lungs, high O2 levels cause it to bind with hemoglobin. And I'll show you a figure that shows how this works. In the tissues, low O2 levels cause a reverse reaction. Now, if you remember, I told you that the structure of hemoglobin is rather complex, much more complex than you would normally guess. The reason why it's so complex is so that it can bind oxygen at the lungs where there's high O2 levels and release oxygen at the tissues where there's low O2 levels. Am I missing some chat? I did miss some chat stuff. Uh, there is gonna be potentially some carbon monoxide generated from engines and batteries. And I don't wanna get into a debate, but I will tell you guys, it's gonna be far better from the environment uh, to have electric vehicles than burning all this fossil fuels. And it's that debate has come primarily from the fossil fuel industry that's trying to rationalize uh, not using uh, electric vehicles. Matt and I have gone back and forth. This is the first time he and I have debated the value of electric vehicles. So we'll probably continue to do that. Um, Matt was in my general biology class this last semester. All right. Anyway, 2% uh, of total oxygen is carried in the plasma, as I showed you in that figure. 98% is bound to hemoglobin. This is at the lungs. And that's why, have you guys ever seen the little finger clip things that they put on? It's got a red light. Uh, and it's checking to see how red your blood is. And that is a pulse oximeter. Oh, you ended up getting one, Matt, after all that. Yeah, I will tell you guys that electric vehicles are the future and California has banned non-electric vehicles after 2035. I recommend go ahead and get on the bandwagon before you're forced to. But if you can't afford one, I get it, they're expensive. But I will tell you, they go like hell. My little electric vehicle can beat most cars, even muscle cars off the line because of the high torque. Anyway, enough of the, uh, you know what swinging contest we're having here. All right, um, moving on. There's four binding sites for oxygen per hemoglobin molecule. I showed you that when I showed you the structure of the hemoglobin molecule in the previous chapter. As the number of binding sites fill with oxygen, percent saturation increases, 
percent saturation is what is being measured by that little finger clip. It's called pulse ox, uh, pulse oximeter or blood oximeter. And it, the reason why they put them on you is because they used to assume if, if a person was breathing in and out normally that they would have plenty of oxygen in their blood. And that's not always the case. It may be the case that someone's breathing in and out, their blood is not being oxygenated, their brain is not receiving oxygen, adequate oxygen, nor is their heart. And by putting the clip on there, it doesn't matter how much you're actually breathing in and out, it's checking to see how oxygenated your blood is. And that's the most important thing to determine if the brain and the heart are getting enough oxygen barring blockages in the vessel. Blood is 98% saturated with O2 and alveolar arteries. That's why when you normally put that thing on your finger, you see the number 98 if you're in good health and um, you don't have any issues with your circulation. Resting cell has, as I showed you in a previous figure, 40 millimeters of mercury PO2. A working cell has 20. So the working cell is using more oxygen, so it's going to have lower oxygen content. That means the hemoglobin is going to unload more at a working cell than it is at a resting cell. More O2 is unloaded when more is needed. This makes sense. The body keeps oxygen in reserve if it's not needed. So when you and I are breathing normally, we only drop off 20, 25% of the oxygen that our blood is carrying to resting cells. That leaves 75% as kind of an oxygen reserve so that when we start running, we don't have to increase our, increase our breathing necessarily instantly in order to have that extra oxygen for ourselves that we need. Okay, so this, uh, there may be multiple choice questions on this, but it is definitely not gonna be an essay, but this is almost identical to the one I used to assign. And the idea is that when you go from the lungs to the tissues and then back, this is what you see. This is at the lungs, this is at the tissues when we're at rest. But if you start exercising, you move this way or holding your, holding your breath. But what we normally consider is as we exercise, your PO2 level, uh, hemoglobin level starts to, uh, saturation of the hemoglobin drops. And that means more oxygen is gonna be unloaded. So that's what this figure is primarily showing. But because there's no essay on it, you guys don't need to worry about the details. All right, in the previous slide, where would you find a cell that's using a large amount of ATP or working? So where would a working cell be? Left or right of these arrows in the center? Here? A working cell. Left? Left. So the harder you work, the more you drop off to the left. How could you cause a cell at rest to have a lower level of O2 than in the graph? Than the graph? So how could we make this whole graph shift downwards even without exercise? How can we get this oxygen curve to go down even if you're just sitting still? I told you earlier in the lecture. Could that be a function of lung disease? Potentially, but I'm saying for a healthy person, what could you do to push this graph downward? I was gonna say what Matt just said in the chat. And that's a breathe, slow your breathing rate. Potentially. High altitude? High altitude is what I was going for. So yeah, you could oh, okay. lower your breathing rate. That would work. You could also have disease. That would work. But the main reason, the main way that you could push this down, normal breathing, normal health is at altitude. How could you cause the amount of saturation to decrease in the alveoli? You, as, as you said, breathe less, you'd have a disease, or you could be um, at altitude. So these were just extensions to see if you understood the figure. Okay, so we finished early. It only took uh, 53 minutes to get through three chapter sections. So I don't know if you guys uh, have any review question questions today, but we are doing our full review next week. Is anybody interested in going over the review question for chapter 22 A, B, or C today? We have a little bit of extra time, no? Okay, the other thing then I'm gonna, because we're not reviewing for an exam this week, we'll do that next week. The, the last thing that, we, that I do have, I actually have time for, barring nobody coming in that door and saying, uh, dad, dad, we got an emergency, you have to come right away. And by the way, the emergency last time was that one of the, our bedrooms uh, lost electricity. And that didn't seem like a huge emergency. But, you know, when you're dad, you got to go take care of that immediately. Anyway, um, so we do have time to go over the last exam, which was exam four. If anybody would like to stick around and go through the questions that they missed with me, 
and I could discuss with you why you missed it or potentially add points, you're welcome to stay around. Um, does anybody have any general questions before we call it a day? Any questions about what's happening this week, next week, uh, what's happening towards the end of the semester? I do. Go ahead, what do you got? When would you be posting the actual grade? What grade? Like the final grade. Do you okay, post so here's the cool thing. Here's the cool thing, exam five and the final have no essays. So that means that the minute you hit submit, it's gonna auto grade it and that'll be your final, that'll be your final grade. So as soon as you finish your final, uh, that's it, that's your final grade. I'm not, I don't need to post anything, whatever is in there. Um, now I will be submitting grades a few days after the end of the semester, but those will match what it says in Canvas with the exception of somebody who's at an 89.8, that'll round off to 90, which is an A, or a 79.6 or seven, rounds off to a B. Other than that, whatever it says is your final grade. And uh, so you don't need to wait for me to let you know what your grade is. You will know the minute you finish your final what your final grade is. So please remember, no begging for extra points, uh, no begging for extra credit assignments. What you see is what you're gonna get because the extra credit has been available on the first four exams only. So what about recommendation letters? Um, recommendation letters. Now, just to let you guys know a uh, couple of things with that. If you want it on paper, you're gonna need to come into my office in Barstow. Mm -hmm. Generally, since COVID, you don't, I don't do recommendation letters per se. What people have been doing since COVID is they put my name down as they submit uh, scholarships or uh, applications for admittance to programs mm -hmm. on their application. And then the school sends something to me that says, how would you rate so-and-so and so-and-so? And so. Now, I will tell you since, now I know Matt a little bit better than most of the rest of you because he already had a class with me and we've talked. So I know him. You guys have had one class with me, so I may not be able to say as much as you would like about you because we haven't talked much. The more that we talk, the more I get to know you, the more I can say about you. So if you've had just this class with me and we haven't talked much, there, I may not be able to say anything significant. Um, I would recommend that you pick an instructor who knows you better than me after only one semester. I know Matt pretty well now. But I used to have students who would take two or three or four classes with me, then ask for a letter of reference. Then I could see their progress over several classes. Were they consistent? Were they constantly working hard? Did they come with a good attitude, et cetera? It's going to be a little bit more challenging. But if you guys finish this class with a B or better, I'll be happy to be a reference for you uh, on any of those things. Does that help, Erica? It sure does. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have any general questions that that everybody might want to know the answer to. Uh, so just in general, you said there's there's no essay questions on the final? No essay, no extra oh. credit for the rest of the semester. So everything else now is going to be auto graded. I don't need to do anything to find for you to find out your grade. Now, the only adjustment to the grade may be if you take exam, let's say exam five, and there's a question that you think you got right that was marked wrong, I can add a point or two, but, I, but I'll tell you at this point, the odds that it would make a difference in your final overall grade is very little. And please remember Barstow College does not do A minus, B plus, it's A, B, C, D, and F. So um, if you are, let's say you're at a 75 and you notice that a point or a question or two was, was off, that's not gonna push you up to the next grade. So. The only way that would make a difference is if you're right on the border. But if you want to discuss your grade with me, uh, and if you think there's a significant issue with the final, I can do the same thing. But um, the class ends on Thursday. So you would need to contact me by Friday if there's an issue. If you wait until Monday, the grades will have already been submitted. And I only change uh, grades if there's a really significant mistake on my part, not just you notice something. So here's another thing I need to let everybody know who's watching. You need to let me know by middle of week eight, if there's any mistakes in the grade book, 
Because if you find a mistake in the grade book a week after the end of the class, I'm not changing your grade. I'm just telling you guys straight up. If there's no mistakes that you've seen, then your grade's your grade. So, because if you find out later on that it was and that you think, oh, Mr. Sage, I actually got a 20 and it wrote 18, and you notice that after the class is over, it's, there's nothing that can be done about that. I'm not going to go back in and change grades because you notice after the class was over that there was a mistake in the grade book. So please take care of that as soon as possible, like now. So if there's any mistakes in the grade book, let me know and we'll fix it. Now, this is another thing I got to remind everybody about. You need to take a screenshot of your final score in, uh, in Labster if you want me to change your grade from a zero. If Labster says you got a zero and you don't have a screenshot showing you completed it with a 20 or an 18 or whatever, I'm not going to give you points just because you say, oh, Mr. Sage, I finished it and I got a 20, but it says a zero. Well, anybody could say that without any evidence. I can't help you. Mr. So, Sage, in regards yeah. to that, when we get our final score, it doesn't tell you what lab it is that it's going for. It just tells you the score. So, and I know in previous times that you brought this up, you said to take a screenshot of it with the identifier of what lab it is, but we can't exactly link the, the score with the lab name. Hmm. Well, probably your best bet then would be to contact Labster and say, hey, I finished it with a 20, but it shows in my grade book a zero. Is there anything that can be done? Um, you guys realize I can't just give you points because you claim it's completed and they don't give me access. Uh, Labster doesn't give me access to see exactly what you've done in the lab. All they give me access to is your final grade. So Would it not... help if we took a picture that showed like the date and time? So that way you can kind of correlate it with the date and time of when yeah. that Labster is open? Anything that, anything that could do it. But I have gotten screenshots that show the grade and the name of the lab. Are you saying there's never a time when the name of the lab and the grade you got on it is on the same screen? No, there is. It's just, I think what she's maybe talking, I could be wrong, but I think what she's talking is about at the very end when it says, congratulations, you're 100% um, completed and here's your score. That is a generic banner, but right when you exit out and you go onto the lab that we were assigned, it does say the title and the grade that you did receive in the completion. Okay. So but you have to like, exit out and go onto the modules to see that. But the only downfall with that is that that doesn't always correlate with exactly what is being reflected at that very final portion of the lobster. So some, that, that's something that I noticed at the very, very, very beginning was that, that you'll get one score at the very final portion of lobster, then you have to back out of it for it to be reflective um, on, your, on your grades, but it sometimes will give us a different number. Well, look, if you can get to a screen that says the name of the lab and your score, I can manually change it. But without some kind of evidence that you've completed it, I can't, I can't do that. They don't give me access to see what exactly you did in Labster. So if you can't find a screen that has the name of the lab and your score on it, um, I won't be able to add points. Because if it just says, congratulations, you got 20 out of 20 on just a generic splash screen, you could have taken that picture whenever. Or it could have, uh, you know, you can even change the uh, the date on a on a photo. So if there's any way that you can get to a screen that shows the name of the lab and your score on it, and you take a picture of that and send it, I can give you the points. Otherwise, the very best I can do is take the zero out. Uh, but um, I've I have sent emails saying that if there's any way that you guys can make get any evidence of it. Uh, you need to do that just in case it doesn't get reported into the grade book. So if you didn't do that because you assumed it was fine, um, I don't know what to tell you. I can't give you points that I don't have evidence for, uh, even though you tell me that you completed it. Anybody can tell me they completed a lab without evidence. I can't give you points. But if you guys can find a workaround, put it into the um, Q&A discussion board and, uh, and maybe you can give each other help on how to get back to the page that has 
the score that you earn, even if it's not on another page or in the gradebook. Okay, that's all I can really say about that for now. If you want to uh, contact Labster or talk to me later, we can, but I'd rather do that off the record. Okay, does anybody else have any more general questions besides that? I would like to meet with you to review the exam. If possible, okay, please. so everybody who would like to meet to review the exam, hang out. Um, what I'm going to do is if there's two or three or four people, I'm going to put most of you guys in the waiting room. So just hang tight and then I'll bring you in as I finish up with other people because I don't want everybody seeing everybody's score. So at this point, because I think we're done with the general question and answer, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.